the city of the Philippines, Manila. Uh, I am Dr. Vivian Bing Fadrilan Camacho, uh, and uh, I'm the faculty, one of the faculty of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. Okay, so uh, again, good morning. So we all know that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease that is caused by uh, your SARS coronavirus too, and it has spread from China to many countries all over the world, including the Philippines. And uh, we have seen that the pandemic conditions have affected all aspects of daily life, including uh, social interaction, uh, travel, trade, our food supplies, and of course, finan uh, financial markets. So the pandemic has brought us to the new era, which is the new normal. And to reduce the impact of uh, COVID-19 in business establishments, it is imperative for us, for employers, to be innovative on how to adapt to this new normal. That is why our uh, uh, webinar for this morning is uh, very timely and essential. Uh, our webinar is entitled Occupational Health in the Time of COVID-19, Dancing with the Outbreak Towards a New Normal. Okay, so before we continue, of course, we would like to welcome all our participants. Uh, at present, we have uh, 78 and uh, 78 participants. No? So um, our participants are not only coming from the Philippines, but we, uh, we also have uh, our colleagues and partners from other countries, including the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization or our CIMEO TROP med network. And we also have uh, participants from uh, UAE and also Saudi Arabia. Um, so welcome again to everybody. So to officially uh, open our session for this morning, I would like to request our Dean the Dean of College of uh, uh, Public Health to give his opening remarks, Dean Vicente Belisario Jr. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bing Camacho. Uh, pleasant morning to all and uh, welcome to this first webinar series, first of the uh, webinar series on environmental and occupational health. And of course, uh, we also welcome you to the College of Public Health uh, which is also designated as the Simea TROPMED Regional Center for Public Health, Hospital Administration, Environmental and Occupational Health. This year marks our 50th year, no? Dr. Gapas, no? as a Simeo Center, and um, we're very privileged to have reached 50 years as part of our Simeo family no? in, in the region. It, it also marks no, our um, uh, uh, 93rd year, no, uh, as far as our existence is concerned, as a unit in the University of the Philippines, Manila. Um, welcome to this webinar series on occupational health in the time of COVID, dancing with the outbreak towards a new normal. And yes, we've heard so much about COVID in the last three, four, or five months. And more and more, we are hearing more, we, more and more, we are hearing much about uh, the new normal. Um, the, the College of Public Health was part of two major events uh, two weeks ago, actually last week. No? This was the DOH presser and a special press conference uh, convened by our media partners. And in both fora, I was asked uh, the fearless forecast about COVID-19 and I said it's here to stay, we don't know the end of it. It, it looks like it's going to be around for quite some time. And as such, um, I, I commend our colleagues from the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health for actually ushering in uh, our continuing education webinar series on COVID-19 and the new normal. Uh, I also like to greet, um, of course, Assistant Dean for Planning and Development, Dr. Vic Molina, who belongs to this department. Our department chair, uh, Dr. P.M. Hernandez. Our coordinator, Dr. Bin Camacho, the rest of our DOH, DOH colleagues and, and, and participants. Currently, you have 86 registered on the screen, and congratulations. 
for for actually starting the way forward as far as continuing education in the College of Public Health is concerned. This is probably going to be part of the new normal no, uh, of the College of Public Health as far as our public service offerings are concerned to include continuing education. We have seen uh, uh, participants no, and, 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 and guests COVID-19 no, its impact on health and productivity you know, and, and thus uh, so much impact on the economy. And uh, we, uh, whether we like it or not, it has made a, a major dent on occupational health you know, and, and in, in, in the Philippines, in the region, and the rest of the world. We are one with the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health in pushing for occupational health programs and services that should aim to protect workers from the hazards, including COVID-19, as well as the other hazards in the workplaces and other work settings. There, are, there is now more work from home, and thus the home should also be a safe place to work in. Uh, we are also one with the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health in pushing for occupational health policy and program development, decision-making, um, an actual practice in the workplace guided by available scientific evidence. And again, in the two major events last week, we were pushing for data, data, and more data to actually provide the evidence for policy, for response, and action of all concerned. I would like to uh, thank in a very, very special way a resource person today, Dr. Joselito. We call him Lito Gapas. He's a, a very good friend, colleague, um, uh, contemporaries in med school, so we're about the same age, no? probably, Dr. Lito, our, our ages are not statistically significant, no? are not different in a statistically significant way. Both of us from, from the other college, no? um, uh, close by, our neighboring college, the College of Medicine. Um, the participants today are so, so privileged no? because you have uh, one of the best speakers in occupational health no? anywhere. Uh, this guy, Dr. Lito, has experience both locally and internationally, both in the public and private sectors. And the College of Public Health, the Regional Center for Environment and Occupational Health, is very, very privileged to have him as one of our adjunct professors. So, Lito, walang iwanan. Habang di pa ako nag-retire, you continue to please help us. No? And, and, and very, very special thanks to you for ushering in the, for our first of the webinar series. So Dr. Lito, historical cat, you're, you're the first, first ever speaker in, in our <laughs> webinar series. Expect also that the DEOH has ushered it in, the other departments will be following suit. And thus, it leads me to my last message to the Department of Environmental and Operational Health. Thanks for leading, leading the way you know, to, uh, for our, all our departments there is no way except the way the OH is, is, is pushing it forward, coming up now with continuing education, continuing professional development, uh, and, and, and sharing of knowledge through this format, the webinar series in the new normal. Um, and, and special congratulations no, for the leadership of Dr. PM, Dr. Bing, your course coordinator, and the rest of the DEOH. Hindi ko na po pagkakahabain. Of course, the, the, the main event is coming up shortly. I hope that all of us will learn lots, lots, lots of things from Dr. Joselito Gapas. Um, after this forum, we end up better, knowing more, and being able to help more in the outside world, especially in our workplace. Isang mapagpalang umaga po sa ating lahat. Best wishes to all. Good morning. Maraming salamat, Dean Belisario, for that uh, inspiring message uh, for this morning. So, uh, Dean Belisario highlighted the uh, public health and social economic impact of uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the role of continuing, uh, continuing education in our uh, uh, fight uh, against uh, this uh, COVID-19 virus. He also mentioned about the uh, uh, the importance of evidence-based policy and program uh, planning, uh, development, and implementation. And lastly, he emphasized uh, the importance of working together, especially uh, now that uh, our workers are back in their workplaces. So it's important 
to uh, work together uh, in our fight against COVID-19. So maraming salamat po ulit din, Belisario, for that uh, uh, opening remarks. So again, good morning, everyone. So moving on, uh, let me uh, present to you our uh, webinar house rules. Okay, so uh, for our participants, please take note of the following. So keep your microphones muted and video off while the webinar is ongoing. You may use the chat box uh, to send your questions for the open forum later on. Uh, you will receive an email with the link to the evaluation form after our webinar. Uh, the certificate of attendance will be sent to the email address that you provided in the registration form upon submission of the evaluation form after the webinar. So uh, the certificate of attendance will be hopefully forwarded to you uh, after uh, two weeks no, upon submission of your uh, evaluation form. And lastly, let us keep this um, activity uh, an open and safe space for all. So, tandaan po natin lahat ang ating house rules. So, maraming salamat. So, uh, before we uh, introduce our speaker, uh, we'll have a very brief, no, a brief uh, uh, participants activity. No? So, we'll have a brief online poll. Um, so, the participants are requested to answer three questions. No, You'll be given a few minutes to answer three questions and, and then we'll uh, show the results right after the poll. So the answers to the poll will hopefully uh, serve as a take-off point uh, for our discussion this morning. So uh, let us now launch the uh, uh, online questions. Okay, so you'll see a, uh, uh, an online poll prompt in front of you right now. So you may answer directly into the uh, poll prompt in front of you. So we have three questions. So for the first question is a mood barometer on a scale of one to five. Today is a Monday, no? So on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling today with five as uh, the highest positive mood? Uh, the second question, which sector do you belong to? Okay, so you have the two question, uh, two choices as answers. Uh, do you belong to the private or the public sector? Uh, and our last question, our number three question is, on a scale of one to five, rate the readiness of your workplace in the prevention and control of COVID-19 with five as the most ready. So we'll just give you a few more seconds, okay? And then we'll see the results. So thank you very much for uh, participating, hopefully. Uh, You'll be able to answer all questions. Okay, so, so far, 87% have voted. So, malapit na tayo mag 100%. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's wait for the others to encode their answers. So, again, we have three questions. Okay. So, ano ang mood nyo today? Let's see kaya kung ano ang ating um, uh, general mood no, of everyone. Now we have 95% of the participants um, uh, who, who have uh, voted. So just a few more. So that's 88 out of the 92. Okay, so you have uh, three questions again. Okay, so now we're almost 100%. Thank you very much. Okay, so anyways, we'll just end the poll. So let's end the poll right now. Now, so we have uh, 86 participants who voted. So let's see the uh, uh, results. No? Uh, can you, hopefully you can see the results of our poll. So for our first question, so what is the mood of everybody? So, wow, that's a, uh, a very good uh, uh, result, no? So between three to five. 
So hopefully the only one who's not feeling good will hopefully feel better after uh, listening to our webinar. So that's uh, great news now that everybody's uh, feeling good okay, right now. And for the uh, number two question, which sector do you be belong to? So most of our participants come from the private sector with 57%. Ayan. So, hindi rin naman magpapahuli ang ating government or public sector with 47%. And then next we have for the uh, last question. So, in terms of readiness of your uh, workplaces to prevent and control COVID-19. Okay, so majority of the participants feel that uh, their uh, company is somewhat ready. No? So, that's... Uh, 40% uh, for a rating of 4, followed by rating of 3, yeah, and then followed by 5. So at least uh, uh, we have this information to uh, also uh, serve as a take of point for our discussion this morning. So with that, thank you very much for participating in our online call. Okay. So... Let's now move on. Again, maraming salamat. Hope you enjoyed the online poll also. So moving on, I would like to call in, I would like to request uh, the Chair of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, Dr. Paul Michael Hernandez, to introduce our speaker for this morning. Dr. PM? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. So let me introduce our... Uh resource person this morning. Our speaker is a graduate, as mentioned by uh, Dean Belisario earlier, uh, our speaker is a graduate of Doctor of Medicine from the University of the Philippines, Manila, and later took Master's in Public Health at uh, Hebrew University Adasa Medical Center. Pursuing occupational health and occupational medicine, he, he received a certificate in occupational medicine from WorkSafe Australia. He's actually a former faculty of the department, uh, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health of UP College of Public Health, and currently a health, uh, the health executive of the first Philippine Holdings Corporation. He is known in both local and international settings uh, because of his experience and expertise in the field of occupational health, and uh, currently he's, he's our adjunct faculty at the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. That's all welcome. Dr. Joselito El Gapas. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Uh, give me a moment to to share my screen so uh, we can we can start the session. There you go. All right. So. Uh, before before we start, I'd like to give my thanks to Dean uh, June Belisario, to uh, Dr. P.M. Hernandez, and for to Dr. Bing Camacho for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Actually, uh, when we started talking about uh, online learning, we spoke about uh, I me providing. Um, a Zoom lecture to two of our graduate students. And through time, uh, that idea has morphed into a uh, full-blown webinar series open to a lot of audience. And to me, that is good because um, uh, it gives me an opportunity to share what I have known along the way and what I have learned when we started uh, uh, engaging our workplaces uh, for the COVID outbreak beginning uh, February of this year. So uh, le let me uh, share with you our learnings and uh, our actions. And hopefully you can pick up uh, one or two things along the way uh, to further enhance either your policies or your programs in the workplace. All right. Uh, moving forward. Okay, right. The need for occupational health services and programs to protect the, and promote the health of workers remain as important today 
as before the COVID-19 outbreak. Addressing this need during the COVID outbreak will require occupational health practitioners and policymakers to be more agile, innovative, and focus on a continuously evolving situation to ensure that the need to protect workers' health and business continuity is achieved. Uh, so that, that's coming from me uh, yesterday when I was uh, preparing for this lecture. Uh, and I think this is the message that I'd like to, to, to sum up uh, for the rest of the lecture. We need to be more agile. We need to be innovative and we need to be focused. There is no such thing as a cut and paste solution across companies or even within companies located in different locations. We have to look at each and every organization and each and every workplace as unique. Preparing and developing uh, their occupational health strategy as the practitioner sees fit. Our session for today will, will cover the following uh, areas. We'll talk about workplace, uh, we'll, sorry, uh, okay. We'll talk about workplace health programs, including health management, and uh, then we'll talk about the COVID-19 outbreak and learning to dance with the virus. After which, uh, we'll talk about how to protect the workers at work, at home, and whilst they are reporting for work. We'll talk about the important role of timely information and workers' awareness. And lastly, we'll cover how the COVID-19 programs should be integrated into existing occupational health programs in workplaces and organizations. So back to basics. What would be the purpose of an occupational health service? The purpose is to protect and promote workers' health and well-being. Its purpose is also to improve work conditions and work environment. And lastly, to advise employers, workers, and their representative on occupational health, its uh, programs, its risks and hazards and control measure. Advising the employer has been very critical nowadays in the era of COVID-19 because just like anybody else, employers, business leaders, and line managers at the start have a gap in their knowledge and awareness, and this gap needs to be filled up quite fast for them to act uh, accordingly. In occupational health, what we want to achieve at the end of the day is to prevent occupational diseases and work accidents. We would like to control workplace health hazards and health risks. We would like to have a healthy and productive work environment. And overall, to have work conducive to workers' health. In occupational health, we op often work with two programs. Two, two, two components. We often work in, uh, by developing occupational health programs and occupational health services. And what you see in, in, in this slide is that for both occupational health programs and health services, there is a plethora of, of, of topics and, and activities and strategies that goes into it. For occupational health programs, we talk about health risk assessment. We talk about work environment monitoring for physical, chemical, and biological health hazards. We talk about managing infectious diseases. We talk about health and wellness, food safety, mental health, for example, substance abuse management, ergonomics, and hearing conservation. For health services, we deliver services to include fitness to work, medical emergency response. We do outpatient services and referrals. And of course, we manage medical data. 
supporting these occupational health programs and services are the major enablers of occupational health, which includes health communication, instruction, and training to our stakeholders at work. We need to do a lot of internal and external stakeholder engagement. Even before COVID, occupational health is quite new to the thinking of organizations. And we have to engage them to see the role and the contribu potential contribution of occupational health to organizations. We would like to manage health like a business in the workplace. So we monitor implementation. We constantly review deliverables and we do a comprehensive audit. And lastly, in occupational health, we make sure that our health organizations, whether big or small, have sufficient competency and training to implement all of this. Okay. The reason why I'm showing this slide is because I'd like to reiterate that occupational health programs and services will continue to remain vital to organizations before, during, and after the COVID outbreak. The health hazards that we have identified and are managing in our workplaces before COVID are still there. They will not go away. In fact, because of the disruption caused by COVID-19, it is quite possible that the existing control measures that we have put in place to manage these this health hazards before might be less effective now and we need to look at it again. Okay. So the message of this slide is health hazards remain in the workplace. We are going back to our workplace either partly or fully and the health hazards would be there. Let us not set aside what we have been doing before to focus solely on COVID-19. Okay. We need to have an integrated program to cover both our original health programs in the workplace, adjusting it to the needs of COVID outbreak. At the end of the day, we manage occupational health as part of the overall health and safety management system. We have to run occupational health like a business where we plan, we do, and we check. Okay, so that portion of my session actually covers the course requirement for the two graduate students that would be in this call. So my subtitle now would be the COVID-19 outbreak added complexity in the development and implementation of occupational health programs and services. I'd like to start with this slide and for those of you who have uh, had the opportunity to read The Hammer and the Dance by Thomas Pueyo. I encourage, for, and for those who have it, I encourage you to read this article because in a very simple manner, uh, Thomas has, has given us a very clear picture of the what do we expect from an outbreak. So according to Thomas, what you would see here would be the normal uh, diagrammatic illustration of an outbreak. An outbreak usually consists of two parts. We have a bell-shaped curve, which shows the, the cases, for example, in an outbreak go up and eventually go down. It doesn't go down completely, but for a while it hovers in the environment. It stays there, sometimes it appears in one area and disappears again, and then it would appear in another area. So it, it is uh, it, this disappearance and uh, government chasing, controlling, disappearing again, government controlling and uh, uh, checking is the dance portion of the outbreak. The hammer, the hammer portion 
is the portion of the outbreak at its worst. It is a bell-shaped curve. It is not always a perfect bell-shaped curve. The, the curve could be uh, skewed to the left or skewed to the right or would have various ups and downs depending on the control that uh, society puts in to manage the outbreak. It also depends on the compliance of population. Okay. But the idea of the hammer is to bring down the number of cases below the capacity of the existing healthcare system to provide. Okay. And that is the idea, uh, the, the main objective of managing the outbreak in the hammer phase. And the hammer in an outbreak is usually very draconian measures like the ECQ or the modified ECQ that we have implemented a few months ago. The idea of that is to bring down the outbreak to a level where the Philippine healthcare system capacity is not overwhelmed. If a healthcare system capacity of a country or a province or a city is overwhelmed, people die. People, co people with COVID die because they don't receive the necessary medical support. And uh, patients with non-COVID illnesses equally requiring hospital services and receive none because uh, hospitals are full would also die. So the objective in the hammer phase, the ECQ and the modified ECQ is to bring down the outbreak. Moving forward with the outbreak, it is not a smooth curve. What happens is that along the way, it will go up, it will go down and up and down, just like a dance. The music continuously changes depending on how good a country or a locality control the outbreak. And you could see this, you could see many examples all over the world. There are many countries in the world that are still in the hammer phase. The Philippines, for example, the United States, India, Brazil, Indonesia, so on and so forth. There are countries who are attempting to dance with the virus. You see quite a number in Europe. You see Thailand, you see Vietnam, you see South Korea and China and Japan. They're trying to dance with the virus, gradually opening up their, their businesses and hoping that they could manage spread along the way. So if we look at this, the hammer in the dance, uh, this gives us a general story of how the virus will play out. How will it will end? We are looking for a, a, uh, uh, a milestone. And the milestone, we hope, would be the availability of a vaccine. In a worst case scenario that a vaccine won't be available, there would be still be the end once we achieve herd immunity in the community. All right. And for practitioners in occupational health, if we keep an eye on the movement of uh, the outbreak, the spread of the outbreak or the diminution of the outbreak in locations where our organization operates, we should be able to dance with the virus. We should be able to advise management when to open up, when not to open up, when to work from home, when critical workers will need to shelter in place in the workplace, living there and sleeping there, ensuring that critical operations are maintained in critical industries. We could advise management when work from home workers would be allowed to work, either part-time or full-time, depending on the risk and what is happening in the outbreak in their locality. We can advise them perhaps those who are 60 years old and above with comorbidities should go back to work last with the younger, stronger workforce coming in first. So the role of an occupational health practitioner, keeping an eye on what's happening in the outbreak in their localities is critical to management at this point. And please bear in mind that 
the whole Philippines is moving to through this fig graph, not at the same time and not at the same manner. The pressure to open up the country for business while ensuring health and safety of the population is really a delicate balancing act. And there are many organizations that will rely on the advice of their health advisors and their health practitioners to provide inputs in their decision making. Workplaces in different parts of the country are opening amidst different COVID outbreak environments. Some of our organizations might be opening up at this point in the outbreak. Cebu, for example, is rapidly becoming the second epicenter of COVID-19 in the Philippines. Is Cebu opening at this pace? Is Metro Manila already at this pace? But the current data yesterday is actually bothersome because we're looking at a second peak, a potential second peak in the national capital region. I doubt if there are uh, provinces in the Philippines that have already gone through the hammer phase and is, in, and is now in decline. But most likely there are workplaces and organizations in other provinces in the Philippines who have had a minimal or moderate COVID outbreak situation that are already in this phase of the outbreak. They're opening up as well and they're learning to dance with it. Baguio City, for example, most likely would be at this stage already. They have managed to control the outbreak in their city and is now dancing with the virus. So long story short, organizations and workplaces would need to dance with the virus moving forward. Occupational health practitioners should keep an eye on how the outbreak is progressing in their respective locations to enable, to advise your organization to be able to dance with the virus. So a few sobering statistics. Um, what you have on the left are the actual numbers reported yesterday. And yesterday, the Department of Health reported 2,434 new and old cases, which is a far cry from the usual 200 to 300 cases every day that we report. And the, the general analysis here is yes, we have more testing capacity at this time. Therefore, we are identifying or testing more. But also, uh, it is not only explainable by the testing capacity, but it is also explainable by the relaxation of the quarantine measures that we have in place. So overall in the Philippines, what you see is the figure from the Department of Health on the left side, where there is a gradual increase in the daily reported cases based on the onset of illness. It is going up. In fact, in a recent report by the UP OCTA, these independent experts from the department, uh, independent of the Depa Department of Health, has calculated the reproduction number, RT, or also called the reproduction rate or R0 in the Philippines to be 1.28 from June 1 to June 19. And it has increased to 1.36 from June 19 to 25 due to increasing cases in Central Visayas and Cebu. The reproduction number is a measure of how much or how many one infected case of COVID-19, how many would that case infect moving forward? So an R T number of 1.28 means that for every one COVID positive case, that case will infect 1.28 other persons. And if the reproductive number is more than one, what it means is that the outbreak is spreading and increasing. If the reproduction number is below one, then it means that the outbreak 
is gradually diminishing and will eventually disappear if it becomes consistently lower than one. Okay. If we look at the statistics for NCR, you would see in the left figure that the statistics would track that of the national statistics, simply because uh, NCR is the main contributor to the positive COVID cases uh, in the Philippines. Okay. So this slide is telling us, let us not let our vigilance and guard down. The virus is still out there. The outbreak is still out there. And as we relax our quarantine measures and workers are beginning to come back to work, then there would be more chances of close contact exposure. There are more chances of, of people getting sick and symptomatic of COVID. In fact, what is bothersome today is that my colleagues in some hospitals are already telling me that Philippine hospitals are filling up again uh, with COVID cases, just like what we experienced in March or April. The good side to that, the good, the positive side to consider there is my colleagues are saying that they are better prepared now than before, but the cases are still on, uh, piling up. Another good news is our death rate is going down. That means we know how to manage uh, patients symptomatic of COVID-19. Okay, so for occupational health practitioners and policymakers out there, please look uh, regularly at the statistics coming out from the Department of Health and other uh, agencies because it will help us in defining and refining our occupational health strategy in our work organizations moving forward. The model that I personally use in, in developing an occupational health program for, for companies that I provide advice to is a simple framework. I tell them, protect the workplace, protect the home, and have a safe journey protocol between the home and the workplace. Protecting the workplace is an obvious or, or uh, unnatural tendency for us health practitioners, occupational health practitioners. However, what I'd like to give emphasis on is we need to put additional attention to protecting the home. Workers go back home, some every day, some after a prolonged shift for sheltering in place. If the home is not protected, they bring the virus to the workplace and vice versa. If the workplace is not protected, they bring the virus home. And in between, we should have a safe journey protocol to make sure that our workers are not exposed to, to, to the virus coming to and going from work. If we drill down further into this framework, we actually look at something like this, that protecting the workplace would require occupational health programs and services. In general, this workplace occupational health programs and services would essentially prevent the spread of disease in the workplace. Please note the word spread, because on the flip side, on the right side of the box, where you have safe journey protocols and family protection program, including expanding occupational health programs to accommodate work from home conditions. In general, these are strategies to prevent seeding the workplace with COVID-19 virus. So, the strategy, the occupational health strategy could be condensed into two parts. Prevent seeding the workplace and prevent spread in the workplace. All the intervention that you will need to put in place would fall in either of these two categories.
So let's talk about protecting the workplace. Protecting the workplace and reducing workers' exposure to COVID-19 will require a comprehensive and programmatic approach to reduce the risk to as low as reasonably practicable. One of the most important things that we as occupational health practitioners or interested in occupational health should achieve at the very start is to obtain company management commitment and support. This is critical to a successful management of COVID-19. Company management commitment and support. Before COVID-19, sometimes it is a challenge to obtain full company management commitment and support. However, COVID-19 has uh, provided us a good opportunity in engaging senior and middle management. It has opened the doors for us to have a clear and educational dialogue with our decision makers. Because at this point, companies and organizations, big and small, are threatened by COVID-19. Secondly, we need to have competent health and safety organization. If many of you are struggling to build or make competent your health teams, this is an opportunity for you to do so because our leaders, organizational leaders and managers, because of the threat to the business, are very open to having a dialogue on how to develop organizations, uh, health and safety uh, organizations. So what are the areas uh, in terms of protecting the workplace that we should look at? We need to look at worker exposure risk assessment. Right. We'll talk about that some more in, in the next slide. We need to have social or better term physical distancing in the workplace. We need to have hand hygiene. We need to have your cough etiquette. We need to have workplace sanitation and decontamination procedures and protocols. You need to have face masks and other PPEs. You need to have a very robust and effective workplace screening, monitoring, surveillance, contact tracing, and referral of workers. We'll talk about that some more uh, at the later part of the presentation. Information and awareness at this time becomes very, very critical, not only to the workers, but to our organizational leaders as well. And lastly, we have to engage and involve our contractors and support personnel. If in the past, organizations have looked at contractors and supporting uh, personnel as giving them less focus, now is the time to at least give them equal or more focus compared to our regular employees. Simply because contractors and support personnel, there is a high chance that this organization would be less equipped to manage and address COVID-19 in the workplace. And managing and protecting our organization is only as strong as its weakest link. If we do not manage our contractors and support personnel, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus does not discriminate based on your uh, status of employment. They will become our weakest link if we don't manage them. For the boxes in white, I would not discuss this any further because I think the, the audience would have you would have sufficient information and sufficient strategies be implemented already in your respective work site. What I'd like to spend time more is discussing about worker exposure risk assessment, screening, information and awareness. When we talk about workers' exposure and aware, uh, what, what we mean by this is simply 
that not all workers are uh, potentially exposed to COVID-19 equally. There is no cut and paste COVID-19 occupational health program, assuming that workers are equally exposed. Workers may be exposed differently by the type and location of their work. For example, there are workers that would spend all of their working time, should they go back to work, inside workplaces, like office workers, assembly line workers. They have lower exposure risk simply because we control the workplace. We have provided enough mitigation measures at work. However, there are also workers who work on site but have regular interface with outside personnel or visitors. For example, receptionists, your security guards. You have people that receive invoices and issue checks. You have people that receive parcels from, 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 from external uh, sources or engage with delivery personnel because they, we want parcels to go out of the company. This type of workers would have medium exposure risk simply because they have regular exposures with other higher risk workers from other companies. Third, there are workers who work outside the company premises as part of their work. Do you have messengers that go out every day? Do you have your delivery persons that go out every day? Sales personnel? company drivers, and so on and so forth. It might be that in the conduct of their day-to-day -day work, their exposure, close contact exposure would be higher compared to your work, those workers spending most of their time in, in, inside the workplace. So type of location would affect the type of mitigation measures that you will need to put in place you have to analyze the risk exposure of the workers based on their jobs and tasks. Another question that we should keep in mind, which in most cases we haven't thought of pre-COVID, is how workers travel to work. Because how they travel to work would affect their exposure risk. For example, if you travel with your own vehicles, like cars, motorcycles, bicycles, etc., electronic trikes, that perhaps would be of lower risk because then you can practice physical distancing. It is healthy to walk to work if you live nearby. And in many companies right now, they are providing shuttle service, making sure that social distancing is implemented in these services. Lastly is public transportation. Okay. Riding public transportation, to me, is a little bit riskier. Of course, we would argue that since there are only 50% uh, of workers coming back to work at this time, then public transportation should not be overly congested. If that is the case, then the, the, the risk would be lower. However, moving forward, if we continue to open up the economy, then you would see that public transportation becomes a big determinant in terms of uh, increasing the risk of exposure if it hasn't already done so. Third, more at this time, we have to look at the community and household factors that impact on our workers. Do our workers li live in communities or barangays with high transmission level or not? Would the risk profile of our workers increase if, for example, there are some members of the household that are frontliners? And also we've looked, uh, we need to look at household living condition. More and more, this becomes important. It is not just as easy as you have to practice home quarantine because many workers will tell us that I can't do that at home because by type of house, 
will not provide me an opportunity to do so. We can't do that because we are 10 in our household sharing two bedrooms and one bathroom. I can't do social distancing and protection because I live in boarding houses, in boarding house and dormitories where in one room there are eight of us because we're construction workers and we're transient and this is the only housing we can afford. So what I'm trying to say is controlling COVID-19 is not will require a lot of sub-analysis and a review of the profile of our workers. Because it is only knowing this, knowing the data behind the background of our workers, could we develop a more effective and efficient COVID-19 control measures at work. Okay, so the lesson for this slide is not all workers have the potential to be exposed to COVID-19 equally. Right. Some word on worker information and awareness. Okay. This has become a very, very vital component in all COVID-19 workplace program. Workers will need to understand what COVID-19 is all about for them to be able to comply with, with uh, the control measures and the proper behaviors. Workers will need to know what is the long-term strategy of my company? What would be the prospects of my company surviving up to next year? So we need to regularly engage our workers in making them aware about the future of the company, where do we got, want to go as an organization? for them to understand and effectively practice the proper behavior. They, this will lead to the development of positive behaviors for better compliance at home and at work. We need to use all available and practical communication media. For those companies who are, shall we say, lucky enough to have uh, access to to, to Zoom or webinars, then let's utilize this as much as possible. Okay. There are other medias that we could use. Form Viber groups, form Facebook groups, okay. because we need to get in touch with workers and communicate to them. It is also very important to provide a venue for employees to provide feedback and ask questions. Because in this time of uncertainty, there are, every time we engage, it will generate a lot of questions from our workers. And please make sure that they have the, the, the capacity to reach back and ask these questions. Organizations could develop their own COVID hotline where, where workers could give them a call. Or organizations could develop their own telemedicine consult, teleconsult services for their workers working from home to be able to consult for their medical problems. There is a need to conduct surveys to understand the employee concern and needs. Again, depending on the technology that uh, uh, you, you, you have, employee engagement during coronavirus is vital. In our workplaces, we always uh, shepherd them to credible information. The Department of Health and the World Health Organization website in particular. Uh, their data is not perfect, but uh, there is, 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 uh, they're more credible uh, compared to, to other uh, sources. At this time, we need to also manage the, the outbreak of fake news which is very difficult to manage if it uh, is not addressed immediately and properly. Okay, a few words about worker health monitoring. In general, what I think is that worker health monitoring should have basically three parts. The first part is the questionnaire, specifically, the 14-day COVID-19 questionnaire, which will look at symptoms, 
which inquires about exposures and household members' health status and exposure for the past 14 days. In our organization, we found this to be very effective in initially screening workers going back to work. This is supplemented by the daily self-assessment questionnaire, which basically, basically asks similar question to the 14-day questionnaire with the timeline of the past two days. How were you feeling yesterday and today before you go back to work? And we do this every day. And it provides us with a good data, good data to analyze the health of our workers. Critical to the questionnaire is the ability to go through the questionnaire fast, ideally before workers go back to work. So for those of us who have good access to Google Forms, then please do so because it gives us a very good and very fast uh, uh, feedback to the answers of our workers. Questionnaire is important. Questionnaire is vital. Second part is worker testing. If you have been monitoring the technical discussions for the past two to three months, there is a, a very lively debate between the, the, the utilization and the use of rapid antibody testing and RT-PCR as part of a return to work screening. Okay. My personal take on that is that let us use the test for what it was designed for to meet the needs of the organization. So our leaders, our organizational leaders should be given the right information on the usefulness of these respective tests. Otherwise, they might make decisions that essentially would be wasteful in terms of resources, both in money and in, in, in the time of, of the workers. So let us use these two tests in the right way based on what they were designed for. Okay, so that is part two. And lastly, part three is what we call control or remedial action place uh, in the uh, remedial, remedial actions in the workplace. Because part one and part two, as we'll talk about later, is not one hand, does not provide 100% security that workers coming back to work is free of COVID-19. So as part of the remedial uh, measure, a reactive measure, we have to have aggressive worker monitoring and surveillance. We have to have effective contact tracing and quarantine. And we need to have isolation facilities for suspected workers. Both part one and part two, part three to me, are vital. Part two, please use with care using the tests for what it was designed for to meet the needs of the organization. Okay, so let's talk about the 14-day COVID-19 questionnaire and the daily screening questionnaire. What has been very good for the past couple of weeks was that there was a, a study or an assessment coming from PISMID last June 14 about the sensitivity and specificity of 14-day symptom-based questionnaire, questionnaire among asymptomatic individuals with possible COVID-19. Okay, based on their evaluation, questionnaires, the 14-day questionnaire has a sensitivity of 92.8% and specificity of 98.3%. Sensitivity is defined as the power of the questionnaire to identify those with positive results among the true positives, while specificity is the power of the test to identify the negative results amongst those who are truly negative. So in short, questionnaires are very useful. Before, if we are giving less attention to this questionnaire and going through it just by compliance, I strongly urge you to take the questionnaire seriously. 
Equally serious is the daily self-screening questionnaire because it's supportive of the 14-day questionnaire. But we have to, to keep our eyes open to its weaknesses. When you use the questionnaire, you use it with open eyes because there are limitations. The first limitation is, is if workers would fear that if they answer truthfully and accurately, that they will lose their income, and this is especially true for daily wage earners, then most likely they will answer less truthfully because they will lose money. Second is that there are asymptomatic and even pre-symptomatic workers that will not recognize their symptoms. So even if they uh, are answering the questionnaire accurately and truthfully to their best ability, they simply do not have the symptoms and we cannot capture them. So keep these limitations in mind when doing the questionnaire. I am hopeful that the limitations would only result in very, very few cases moving forward after the questionnaire. Okay, let's talk about testing. Okay, it's very simple. RT-PCR test is the test that will detect the virus. It answers the basic question, am I currently infected? COVID-19 PCR and antigen tests have very high sensitivity, okay? On the other side, antibody, rapid antibody tests, or also known as the lateral flow test, is a test that will detect the antibody. It answers the question, have I had exposure? So it's in the past tense. We use the COVID-19 antibody test because it has very high specificity. The challenge with many organizations is that, especially amongst the non-health part of the organization, is we tend to confuse these two. We tend to use the rapid antibody test because it's easy. It, it can be used at the point of contact or point of care. It gives us, gives us results within 10 to 15 minutes, but it actually doesn't identify the virus. It is the confusion that sets false expectations amongst business leaders. Therefore, our role as health practitioner is to make sure that our business leader understand when rapid antibody tests would be useful and when the RT-PCR test would be useful. It is also important for us to understand that these are not perfect tests. So when we talk about RT-PCR, this is what we know at present, at least what I know at present, that a positive RT-PCR test confirms the presence of SARS-CoV-2. So if you turn out positive, tapos unboxing, you are positive for SARS-CoV-2. However, RT-PCR has a limitation. A negative RT-PCR test has intrinsic false negativity. In several journal articles, they have actually estimated the false negativity of RT-PCR test as from day one post-exposure to day 21. What you will notice is, is that day one, immediately after exposure, the RT-PCR test is 100% false negative. And as you progress more towards the, the, the history of the illness, then the false negativity uh, declines. At best, it is around day eight after infection where RT-PCR test is most useful. It has only 20% false negativity rate. And then the false negativity again increases as it moves forward from day 9 to day 21. And the reason behind this is the viral load. 
At day one, obviously, the viral load is so low, it cannot be detected by an RT-PCR. And on later days, the viral load begins to decline. And also, therefore, the false, false negativity of RT-PCR would gradually increase. But is RT-PCR useful? Yes, if you use it at the right time. So I, I tell, I, I advise our workplaces, if you have somebody contact trace because you have a, a PUI or a suspected case in the workplace, don't have the RT-PCR test the following day. Go make, make that person go on quarantine and around day eight, or the onset of symptoms, then you might want to have RT-PCR test that. Okay. And what do we know about the antibody test? Okay. For those of you who have uh, looked at the literature in the various brands of uh, rapid antibody tests available in the Philippine market, you would see that what they tell us is the sensitivity and specificity is quite high in the high 90s. Okay. But let us be conscious of the fact that the sensitivity and specificity of the rapid antibody test would be this high at the right time because the antibody titer would vary moving forward. Take note that the rapid antibody test will detect the presence of COVID-19 antibodies, not the COVID-19 virus. RT-PCR does this. It took me several presentations for management to understand the difference because we need to manage their expectation. The sensitivity and specificity of all rapid antibody tests and even the elegant ELISA test are dependent on the time of testing, perhaps at least 20 days after infection or two weeks after symptoms, giving the body enough time to develop sufficient antibodies to be detected. And this is best illustrated here in a, a figure that I borrowed from Roche. And uh, what it says here is that one, before the symptom onset, it is unlikely that we will have a positive test, whether it's RT-PCR or uh, antibody, rapid antibody test. And that as the disease, the viral load progresses, and as the antibody IgM and IgG develop subsequently a few weeks thereafter, then perhaps RT-PCR would gain more importance and uh, so is the rapid antibody testing. But keep in mind that the proper timing of this test should be considered every time. What we would like to avoid is for organization to have knee-jerk reaction. Somebody tested positive, everybody they want to have RT-PCR or rapid antibody testing. We have to advise them properly on the use of this test. All right. What I'd like to share with you are, there are some quite several studies actually all over the world, uh, which indicate that the, the proportion of asymptomatic cases among RT-PCR positive diagnosed patients is actually quite high from anywhere from the 40 to the 80 percent. So if you look at just three examples including the Diamond Princess cruise ship, if you look at the Diamond Princess of the 3,711 uh, passengers and crew on board, 712 were diagnosed by RT-PCR to be positive and only and around 331 of those are asymptomatic or 46.5%. So the proportion of, of, of people or even workers who might be infected with COVID manage to get well and return to work 
might be potentially high, around 40%. And this is the reason why I show this slide because there are there are specific uses, for example, of uh, the rapid antibody tests for workers coming back to work. Okay. There are organizations which would use the rapid antibody tests to conduct zero prevalence studies amongst returning workers who have been on work from home, let's say, for the past three months. So what can be obtained by doing the zero prevalence survey is to obtain the profile of past exposure to COVID-19 virus among workers based on the presence of antibodies. It has value because if, if the, the prevalence of positivity of antibodies is very low, it gives us an indication that our workers who have been on work from home for three months have indeed been practicing the proper behavior and the proper precautions to protect themselves. And that organization will be more assured that even if they ask their workers to come back to work, either part-time or full-time, and then go back home again every day, they would be given some assurance that when they go back home, workers would continue to practice the proper behavior. The second objective of the rapid antibody test in a seroprevalent study would tend to identify possible susceptible or at-risk groups or clusters. For example, is there clustering of positivity between office workers and those who work in the project site, among urban workers and rural-based workers, among regular employees and contract workers. It is important for the company to have this information so that moving forward, as we dance with the virus, we can redevelop, reorient, refocus our priorities to more at-risk groups of workers. Lastly, workers also have concerns about uh, their, their COVID-19 status. So having a seroprevalence study or participating in a seroprevalence study could address concerns of workers to potential past exposures while on community quarantine and working from home. The caveat here is there is a need for careful explanation about the results of the RAT that the rat or the rapid antibody test looks for antibody and does not look for the virus okay they 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 need to be made to understand the proper interpretation of the results of the rapid antibody test to manage and mitigate their concern of course there's a bonus in companies that are using the rapid antibody test and back to back with RT-PCR in the return to work screening, then those who screen for IgM positive would eventually be tested using RT-PCR to determine the presence of present COVID-19 infection. So there's a little bonus to that, but that is the main, that not the main purpose of using uh, the rapid antibody test as a return to work screening tool. It is best used as a zero prevalence study tool and use it based on uh, epidemiologic principles and looking at workers as a community rather than looking at workers as individuals. Okay, the last part of our uh, workplace strategy is the recovery strategy of workplace screening, monitoring, and surveillance. So what does this entail? In the workplace, we need to have a robust monitoring and surveillance, which will include employee self-reporting or employees reporting other employees with potential symptoms at work, having a number or a COVID hotline they can report to and get instructions from. So all of these are components of monitoring and surveillance. Organizations should have rapid and immediate contact tracing 
including quarantine and isolation of suspected workers. You have to have a plan. Contact tracing, we thought, was very easy to do. In fact, it was very, very challenging, especially when we need to take into consideration data privacy. We would like to hide the name of the employee who've had, who is a suspect COVID case. It's very difficult. You get pressure from workers wanting to know who the person was because they want to assess themselves on their uh, risk and exposure. So it's very, very challenging. So for those of you who, who, who have their, your contact tracing protocols and quarantine protocols, it might be useful to revisit them. And once we have identified our contact trace personnel, where do we bring them to? Do we bring them to hospitals? to clinics? Do we have a company organized quarantine uh, facilities? So you have to have an end-to-end -end plan because there is no strategy to ensure a 100% COVID-free workforce. Okay, We cannot screen 100%. Questionnaires have their strengths and their inherent weaknesses. RT-PCR and rapid antibody tests and even ELISA have their inherent weaknesses as well. So we should be ready because there is a possibility that we would encounter a COVID-19 infected employee in our workplace. All right. So please focus on workers' awareness and self or co-worker reporting. Focus on contact tracing. Focus on quarantine and referral. And of course, focus on return to work. I'd like to have, I, I have one slide on, 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 on protecting, uh, protecting the home. Okay. To me, households are the true frontliners. As uh, some of my doctor's friends in the emergency room is saying, kayo po ang talagang frontliners because it is us in our homes every day who is trying to fight the virus by keeping safe at home. If the true frontliners fail, then people get sick and go to the emergency room. And by that time, the frontliners, we as a frontliner have already lost the battle. So what do we need to know? We have to protect the home because the home could be a potential source of infection that we bring to the workplace and vice versa. We need to give information to our household members on how to protect a healthy household during an ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. These are the basic principles which almost everybody now know, but we need to develop proper attitudes and behaviors on. Physical distancing, hand hygiene, tough etiquette at home, cleaning and decontamination, sanitizing, waste disposal, the use of face masks outside the home. Lots of good studies right now showing the, the, the risk reduction uh, arising from the proper use of face masks. We have to prioritize organizing trips outside, to essential trips only. Okay. It's still not time to go to the pubs, to the cafes, and to the bars. I hope none of you are practicing these behaviors. Household will need to be aware of signs and symptoms of COVID-19 so they can properly monitor and take action. And an emerging issue is mental health at work and at home because mental health becomes a priority now as more and more people spend their time indoors and at home with members of their families and cut off from their social network. Household will need to have more information and competency in taking care of a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case on home quarantine. Okay, It is now part of the protocol that if you have very mild or asymptomatic symptoms, you tested RTPR positive, you're sent home for home quarantine. There are rules, there are specific uh, information on how to manage this. I've listed a few in this slide, but long story short, 
people or household members will need to know to make sure that we can conduct proper home quarantine and protect the rest of the household members. So in essence, that's the message on protecting the home. You need to have a safe link, traveling from work to home and vice versa. There are safer modes of transportation, which we, of course, need to iterate the need for proper and regular cleaning and decontamination. Shown to you are the examples of, shall we say, safer modes of transportation. There are less safe modes, especially if you take public transportation, especially if the, the traveling public are becoming more and more as our quarantine measures are relaxed. But let us wear our face masks, hand hygiene, tough etiquette, and social distancing if possible. Okay. So in essence, we need to protect the home, we need to have a safe link, and we need to protect the workplace. So back to the workplace. Okay. I'd like to go back and revisit the slide that I've shown you earlier and saying a few words about how COVID-19 have in fact in impacted and modified uh, these issues and concern. When we talk about health risk assessment and management, okay, we have done this for the traditional health hazards before. We would like to do this in the light of COVID-19 as well. Did the work change, the health risk change across the different jobs and tasks with COVID-19? Most definitely for some workers, messengers, receptionists, okay, public workers, frontline workers. Work environment monitoring has essentially been the same. We need to monitor the, the physical, chemical, and biologic health hazards as appropriate. We have to manage infectious diseases. We still have our problems with tuberculosis, hepatitis, and so on and so forth. And we're now adding managing COVID-19 in the workplace. Health and wellness has become extremely important now, especially when, when most of our workers are working from home and are not allowed to do or not given the opportunity to exercise, for example. So we need to reiterate and communicate. Healthy eating, healthy sleep, proper sleep, proper exercise, what, what we can do at home, so health and wellness becomes a priority because it has an impact on the severity of COVID-19. It has an impact on having good immunity against COVID-19. Mental health has become a frontline issue, not only in the workplace, but also in people working from home. Okay. Things have changed. Uh, the main contributors in our recent survey include social isolation, Okay, the inability to, 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 to work properly at home, the, the various stressors at home where work and family limit or boundaries are, have been blurred, that working times have been blurred. Okay, Your coworkers know exactly where you are, you're at home. So sometimes the, the emails and the telecons would, would, would come even in the very early or very late in the day. So mental health issues, among other things, uh, it's become more and more. The fear and anxiety of COVID-19, the lack of control to the ongoing outbreak, all of this will, will be distilled into big stressors causing anxiety uh, among several of our coworkers. Food safety is an issue, okay? is a potential source. Ergonomics, as we work more and more from home, we find ourselves working in less ideal ergonomic work situations. Uh, there is a joke in our company that perhaps soon we will be introducing an ergonomic loan or an ergonomic care benefit to make sure that everybody has uh, uh, a, a good work area at home. But none of us, not all of us, will have an opportunity to design an ergonomically appropriate workplace from home. So this needs to be looked at at this time. Substance abuse management. 
there is statistics now which shows that there is an increasing problem of substance abuse, both illegal drugs and alcohol um, during the COVID period because more and more people are turning to alcohol and other substance of abuse to manage the existing anxiety and stress during COVID. It is to work, it's an issue. As workers come to work, we have to make sure that they're fit to work. Fit to work in the traditional sense that we do before COVID, but now fitness to work to make sure that at best, we have screened them for potential signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Medical emergency response is a very vital element in health programs before. And now it has an added dimension. What do we do if we have identified uh, a person, a suspected person in the workplace? Then we have to have emergency response measures as well. How do we refer sick workers now to hospitals, which has become very challenging during the period of COVID? And we have to manage medical information and medical data. Okay. And all of this, again, going back to my initial slide, has have to be supported by health communication, instruction and training, implementation, monitoring, and review and audit, internal and external stakeholder management and engagement, health competency development and training. So I'm nearing the end of my presentation, but the message here is that occupational health before is still valid occupational health during COVID and after. We need to adjust to the COVID-19 outbreak because it has modified the way we manage and design our occupational health programs and strategies. Okay, going to my last slide, I usually present this slide as a future looking slide on what are the future issues of occupational health service development before COVID. And I always mention to my students that more or less there are around 10, at least 10 future issues. But what we have noticed and experienced during COVID is that these future issues have now significantly advanced to the present. Because now we have to talk about distance work or telework and working from home. It was never a main issue before COVID. Now we have to look at more and more psychological and sociological issues that are becoming dominant. The irregular work patterns and work schedules have become a reality. New technologies, materials, and work organizations have also uh, come into play. For example, now we can conduct a webinar or big group the uh, information sharing using Zoom, which before we never did. Okay, these are new technologies coming into play, new materials, a new work organization. In fact, in our organization, there is now a long-term uh, plan to re-evaluate post-COVID how our organization should look like ideally to ensure the maximum of health and safety and productivity. Because along the way, we have learned good things as well. We have learned that we don't need to spend 100% of our eight hours physically present at work and that we can be easily as productive or even more productive working from home. Number five, the pressure of increasing productivity and quality resulting in the need for strong employee motivation has now come into play. As people begin to work from home, how do we ensure that they remain productive and deliver quality work? How do we motivate them? Because they are now basically self-driven and minimally supervised. It has become very challenging. Another issue that has now come into play is evolution in small enterprises and those self-employed. How many small enterprises have closed in Gandao? How many small enterprises have managed to survive by pick-up services, by home delivery services, 
by by moving into the the virtual world in terms of their marketing and uh, business processes. How many people now are self-employed? Half of my friends are all already learning how to how to bake from cookies to to uh, to cakes and offering them online. More and more people are becoming self-employed, and new small enterprises are cropping up all over the place. Okay, aging workforce. Okay, although age has become an issue, I'd rather not look at it as age an issue, but uh, health risk as an issue. Where uh, workers, uh, let's say, 60 years old and with comorbidities are discouraged to come back to work at this time. So we have mobile workplaces, globalization of the work economy, and our mobile workforce, which are the OFWs. But what you would see is at least six of these future issues in occupational health are now with us at present. Okay. I'd like to end there because then it is, it, it is now actually a new world. We have to dance with the outbreak. We have to dance with the virus. We have to help our organizations navigate. It is not going to be a smooth ride. The music changes constantly. Therefore, our occupational health strategies and what we do at work would also vary depending on the risk of the outbreak around us. So I encourage everybody to be more vigilant and to get a strong handle in your health strategies for us to be able to dance with the virus. We need to do this until we reach the end. Hopefully, it will be with the uh, vaccine being made more available to, to everybody, to the general public. But until then, let us dance with the virus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gapas, for your uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, discussion on COVID-19. So just a very quick recap of uh, what uh, uh, was discussed. No? So Dr. Gapas uh, is able to provide us a framework on how to dance with the outbreak uh, towards a new normal. So first, uh, of course, protecting the workplace and then protecting the whole. And of course, uh, let's not forget uh, providing uh, uh, a platform wherein there will be safe journeys for our work uh, our workers. So just to highlight a few uh, items that he mentioned, he uh, emphasized, of course, the role of uh, risk assessment of our workers' exposure, uh, which is critical in determining um, what uh, control measures that should be in place. And then, of course, uh, uh, we need to uh, assess uh, scientific evidence that can direct our decision making, especially in testing and also uh, in uh, policy and program uh, development. And then, uh, of course, information campaign is very critical uh, among our workers. We need to empower them uh, so that uh, they will be able to comply with our uh, uh, policies and programs. And of course, uh, he mentioned about emerging occupational health issues in relation uh, to this uh, new normal that is upon us. Of course, we have uh, the uh, different uh, alternative uh, uh, work arrangements such as work from home, the aging workforce, mental health issues among others uh, that need to be addressed as we continue to adapt to the new normal. So um, let's now uh, proceed with the, uh, let's now proceed with the open forum. Okay, so I, uh, was able to receive a number of questions. So you can uh, send the, uh, your questions through the chat box. So, okay, for our first question, uh, we have uh, from uh, uh, Ms. Cariaga. Uh, Dr. Gapas, do you recommend RAT or RT-PCR for establishments before they allow their employees back to work? or it would still depend on their answer on the 14-day questionnaire if they think they have been exposed to COVID-19? 
Okay, thank you very much for the question. What I strongly recommend is to have the questionnaire in place and to have your, your contact tracing and monitoring in the workplace available, also established. When it comes to the selection or choosing between the rapid antibody test and the RT-PCR, you have to go back to exactly why, what do you want to achieve by doing this test? If, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you want to know the profile of your returning worker in terms of their historical exposure to COVID-19, then at a certain point when they return to the workplace, then the rapid antibody testing would prove useful as a zero prevalence study. Do I recommend RT-PCR? It actually depends on your, on your company. Um, I was talking to one of the senior leaders of one company and we were talking about the cost of RT-PCR, for example, is, 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 it, it's expensive. And if you're looking at a large number of workers, then it can be unreasonable. So RT-PCR, for example, is only useful if your, your workers are going to work and they are going to shelter in place, let's say for two weeks or one month. You cannot do RT-PCR or rapid antibody test if your workers will go home every day because there is always a risk of exposure when they go home or when they travel to and from home, then it would be very challenging and very cost uh, uh, not cost effective. So my recommendation is you use the test properly. If for example, you have a, you're working for a company with a multi-billion dollar asset, like a big power plant, multi-billion, and you have 30 workers going on shelter in place, then the cost of RT-PCR before they come back to work, uh, let's say every month, if they do that rotation, would be very cost effective because you're protecting a multi-billion dollar business. However, if your business is not of that kind, then it puts into question the utility of an RT-PCR. So there is no straightforward question on whether to use RT-PCR or RAT. You have to look at the type of business your organization is in, the type of work activity that your workers are going to do. Are they going to shelter in place? Are they going back home every day? Then after that, you have to truly look at what are these tests designed for? And then you make a decision on whether to use RT-PCR or if you find that rapid antibody testing has a place in your organization, or would you rather focus on the questionnaire and then bypass totally the testing? You have to, to, to make your decision in consultation with your respective organization. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Gapa. So you need to consider a lot of factors as mentioned by our speaker. So for our next question, uh, the question is from uh, Dr. Uh, Hippolito, one of our uh, MOH students. Can a person who had COVID-19 be still reinfected with uh, COVID-19? And why is it that those who had uh, uh, PCR negative before, uh, there are also those who become pos PCR positive again? Okay, um, there are now uh, quite a number of literatures coming out of print uh, talking about these topics. Uh, let me uh, answer the second one because that's the one I remember. Okay, uh, short memory, sorry. Uh, negative PCR before and positive PCR now. Basically, there are literature saying that a person recovered from COVID continues to express dead cells and uh, viral fragments from the respiratory tract even months after recovery so that it is possible that if you do RT-PCR uh, you might have a positive uh, result because RT-PCR would detect the viral fragments but the patient remains uninfec uh, not infectious already and there's also uh, literature coming 
coming out recently that uh, around 10 or to 13 days after the cessation of symptoms that uh, a patient would most likely be non-infectious already. So there you go. On your first question about uh, uh, resistance, uh, does COVID-19, uh, even if you have uh, IgG, for example, antibody would confer immunity? Actually, that's still a toss-up right now because uh, uh, the literatures that I come across uh, uh, indicate that uh, surprisingly, those there is a much weaker antibody response among COVID patients as expected compared to those of other co coronaviruses. So that there is no assurance that uh, those who have been infected and recovered could not be reinfected again. So that's what I know. I don't have much time at this moment to actually drill the literature. But those who have recovered are still advised to treat, to take the same precaution even before that they were taking before they were infected with COVID-19. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Sir Lito, for uh, that answer. Our next question, uh, for micro to small businesses, will they be required to create or, or submit safety and health policies and procedures to DOLE before reopening? Is there a requirement for that? I am not very sure um, for small and medium scale. I know for medium and large, the Department of Labor has actually released a checklist and uh, of, uh, of what needs to be put in place. The Department of Health has also come up with guidelines on what we need to put in place for, for uh, organizations and workplaces. And in fact, even in organizations that I work with, uh, there has been increasing daily inspection of, of actual work sites using the checklist just to make sure that we have uh, the proper COVID-19 requirement and protocols in place. For small, uh, I would assume all things being equal, we should practice uh, the precautionary measures as well. Uh, but the most challenging, to be honest, would be the small, uh, small scale uh, businesses. They are resource challenged and their ability to to, to put things in place might be limited. But if you are advising this, this, this uh, sector, uh, it also will be very interesting and challenging because we have to put in place innovations uh, out of the box thinking, for especially for small scale industry. Yes, so thank you very much again a challenge for our uh, small scale businesses. So next uh, our question, Dr. Gapas, how can we ensure uh, occupational health standards for work from home arrangements? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, um, work from home arrangement is actually a new phenomenon right now brought about by COVID. And I think the requirements are not yet fully in place. Uh, I don't think enough attention by the relevant experts and uh, uh, regulatory agencies have provided to working at, from home. Uh, but it is a very exciting time at this point because as health practitioners, it, give us, it gives us actually a good opportunity think around the health risks and hazards of working from home and develop our own unique control measures. And I believe that uh, the, the control measures uh, are there. The literature are, is available for, on, on what we can put in place. Uh, it only needs to have a new revisit and, and project it into a work from home workplace environment. The ergonomic principles are there. Mental health and emotional well-being is there. We have sufficient data. It, it challenges us to be innovative. Noise, stress at home, uh, lighting, et cetera, et cetera, would, would be, would, would, we have enough literature. 
But if you're looking for a package guide, um, I haven't come across one at this point. So uh, that's a work in progress, definitely, because the work from home is the new normal right now. So thank you, Dr. Gapa. So I think I'll just read last two questions. Okay, so uh, the next question is, uh, what is the role of the local government unit in uh, prevention and control uh, of COVID-19 in our workplaces? Is there a, some sort of a protocol connecting our workplaces to, uh, uh, to, our, uh, to the public uh, uh, agencies? Uh, right now, I think the local government unit have been focusing on COVID-19 outbreak as a specific uh, public health emergency. Uh, I am not very sure if uh, local government units have started giving attention to workplace issues and concerns uh, at this time, but I am hopeful that moving forward as, as the local government unit gets a better grasp on these public health issues, then more and more they could begin looking at workplaces. But even so, as health practitioner, it is, a, I think, up to us to make sure that our occupational health programs that we develop in our workplaces are linked to LGU strategies as you see fit. It is, uh, let us take it upon ourselves to link to LGU protocols. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gapa. So for our last question, Actually, it's uh, uh, two, two, in a way, two questions, but it's related to the 14-day symptom-based questionnaire that you mentioned earlier. Uh, do we have a standard 14-day questionnaire? And the follow-up question is, will the 14-day symptom-based questionnaire be as sensitive as it is even if the duration of exposure and duration of uh, off-exposure have been shortened, uh, such as one week duty, for example, and then uh, followed by one week off schemes. Okay, the 14-day the questionnaire consists of basically asking workers symptoms, asking workers exposures. Did you visit the hospital? Have you gone to this and that? Uh, it also looks at potential exposures coming from household members. Do you have a frontliner in your household? Uh, do you have somebody who have symptoms of influenza-like symptoms in your household? So it revolves around that. Employees' symptoms and, sub and uh, signs, uh, employee exposure, and then household profile. So the 14-day questionnaire should be short. And the shorter the questionnaire, the better for compliance. Um, the 14-day questionnaire, uh, personally, uh, if the question is, if I have also a, a let's say, uh, workers who work seven weeks and then go home for seven weeks, those on rotation, would the 14-day questionnaire be useful as well? Um, I, think, I think so. It is, uh, it is actually your call whether to, to use the 14-day questionnaire every 14 days. It is a retrospective questionnaire. But what is also required by, by the Department of Trade and Industry and I think the Department of Labor and Employment is that all work sites should have a daily questionnaire. So um, the minimum requirement, the way I see it is have a 14-day questionnaire retrospective uh, before employees go back to work and when they are already at work to begin implementing the daily questionnaire. If you want to be, to, to be really sure, every 14 days, on top of the daily questionnaire, you ask them a summary of the past 14 days. Okay. So, uh, so far, in fact, in one of our companies, we have implemented only the screening questionnaire as a screening tool for COVID. And for the past three months, we haven't had a COVID case in the workplace. So the questionnaire is very, very effective so far. So thank you very much, Dr. Gapas. That's it for our open forum.
uh, we would like to thank again our speaker, our adjunct faculty for uh, uh, accommodating our invitation to uh, share his expertise and experience with, uh, of course, uh, occupational health in the time of COVID-19. So, maraming salamat again, Dr. Gapas. Sana po'y wag po kayo ulit magsawa sa amin. Ayan. So, thank you. Before we, uh, uh, before we uh, uh, close the webinar, I would like to request our chair, uh, Dr. Paul Michael Hernandez, to give uh, the closing remarks uh, uh, for this webinar. Dr. PM? Yes. Uh, good morning again. Uh, so I'm Dr. PM Hernandez, uh, Chair of both uh, UPDOH and uh, actually the Master of Occupational Health Committee. Uh, we would like again to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Rosalito Gapas. Thank you again, doc, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, our adjunct faculty for taking time to align with us uh, this morning on how to dance with the outbreak towards a new normal. Uh, your insights are always appreciated. Thank you, Po. And uh, we hope to see you soon in, our, in another lecture. Special thanks to Dr. Camacho for accepting the responsibility to coordinate the first ever EOH webinar. Thank you, Doc Bing. Uh, the long planning really did pay off. Uh, thank you also to our um, faculty members and support staff for the EOH webinar series. A special shout out to Prof. Abby Noveso, uh, the EH webinar coordinator. Uh, Sir Harvey Domingo, our webinar co-host, uh, and primary webinar technical support. So, buti na lang, wala tayong masyadong problems. Uh, Dr. Tal Estrada as the EH uh, webinar co-host. Also, thank you to our reps and admin staff as uh, Ian, Mame, Sir John, Che, and Heidi. Uh, the webinar that you all joined today is only a culmination of weeks of planning, testing, and implementation. Thank you to Dr. Belisario, our Dean and Semiotropment Philippine Center Director. Uh, also, thank you to Assistant to the Dean and Deputy Director of Simeotrop Med Philippines, Dr. Vic Molina. Thank you to Doc Emer Faraon, the CPH Info Committee Chair, uh, Prof. June Gregorio, the CPH Public Service Committee Chair, and to the rest of CPH. We would also like to thank uh, the UP Information Management Service for disseminating our invitation and to the rest of UP Manila. And um, aside from the usual uh, plan, Ah, PDCA, uh, I would like to emphasize points in ensuring that we will be able to dance with the pandemic. Uh, allow me to use the acronym uh, for the main, four main principles of industrial hygiene, your AREC, A, -R -E -C. A is for uh, assess. So kindly uh, come up with needs assessment that, uh, that your com um, for your company in terms of what you have, where you want to go and how your company would, will go there. Uh, in terms of health and safety amidst the pandemic. So Dr. Gapas mentioned that you need to check what you have uh, and be clear on, um, on what you want to achieve. So that's A for assess. R is for reinforce. Uh, kindly take note, as uh, we always emphasize in our lectures, uh, both in uh, classes and in public lectures such as this, uh, health is a basic human right. Be guided with this in promoting and protecting health and safety in your workplace. So reinforce this uh, basic human right. For E, that would be engage. Engage all stakeholders, uh, the employer, the workers, the third par party service providers, and the regulators. They will all provide uh, very important inputs in terms of developing your plans and interventions. And lastly, so A-R-E, and lastly would be C, celebrate. Okay, why celebrate? Uh, please celebrate your accomplishments in your activities and programs. Uh, medyo stressful na nga ngayon. Uh, maraming nangyayari, maraming bagong problema ang lumalabas, lalo na kapag uh, ginagawa natin itong mga, um, uh, uh, itong mga programa. So, as part of monitoring evaluation, we, we, we do look at rooms for improvement, but do not forget to acknowledge accomplishments. Celebrate small wins. Again, thank you very much, and we look forward um, to seeing everyone and your colleagues in future webinars. So kindly take note, we have an EH webinar uh, this Thursday, July 6, I'm sorry, July 9, uh, trainings or even in our uh, virtual classes. So, so the MOH, MSPH, EH, and other programs are, uh, are still open, open for application until July 31. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, so please don't, do not hesitate to, me to message us 
through our different platforms. Uh, with that, uh, kindly stay healthy and safe. Good morning. Thank you very much, you. Dr. Hernandez. Okay, so just to uh, reiterate, so the, our department, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health is active in the academic, continuing education, research, and public service activities within the college. So we offer the, uh, these two programs, Semester of Occupational Health, Master of Science in Public Health and Environmental Health. So uh, these programs are the only programs in the Philippines in the said field. So please, if you're interested, uh, the, our application is still open. And of course, uh, uh, the, our services to you, uh, our services that are being offered in the department are being flashed right now. So for more details, you may uh, check out our uh, Facebook and our uh, website accounts as uh, being flashed here. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much. I, and also just to remind again everybody, our July 9, uh, second installment of uh, 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 our webinar in uh, environmental health this time around. So it's a key environmental health interventions for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the speaker will be Dr. Bonifacio Magtibay. Uh, he's also our adjunct faculty and from the World Health Organization. So again, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Gapas, for uh, accommodating our invitation and for that very comprehensive and helpful um, uh, discussion. And of course, inyo pong lahat to everyone, to all the participants who joined us this morning. Thank you very much and we are looking forward uh, to, see, uh, to be seeing you in our uh, future activities. So with that, good morning and stay safe, healthy and happy. Okay, so photo opportunity before we all say goodbye. So kindly turn on your cameras to join the photo. Okay. I so my breakout rooms. <laughs> Meron po tayong five pages, so hindi po ako sure if you are on that, if we are all on the same page, but um, I'll be taking one okay, for the first. Okay, so just to be sure. Next page. Kindly turn on the vi your video so that you'll be included in uh, the photo op next one and last one okay okay so thank you very much would right. like to thank uh, Harvey would like to thank everyone for uh, joining us uh, thank you so again, good morning. Morning. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Lito.